So welcome. So I just wanted to start off by, you know, noticing, noticing what's happening right now to all of us is that we're still in this thing called uh, quarantine, actually it's seclusion or voluntary social distancing or in some places it's a bit more serious than voluntary social distancing. You don't have any choice and you can't leave your house. And when I was taking my <clears throat> illegal walk into the park this morning, all the parks are closed here. You're not supposed to go into the parks or the trails or anything, but I wake up at five o'clock in the morning and sneak in and uh, hopefully, hopefully nobody will ever see me doing this because I need my walk. So I was thinking on my walk that what is this time period really like for us? And I just had a flashback to my very first dieta that I did in the jungle. And it's almost exactly like that without the crickets, unless you're living in the tropics. And we're kind of stuck, especially if you're stuck alone, you know, if you're being alone. We're in a process that would be ideal for dieta. And in fact, in a way, is a forced dieta, is a forced seclusion. In the tradition, when you do a dieta, you're doing it in a hut in the jungle and you don't see or talk to anybody for two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, six months. Some people even go for a year where you're just sitting in this little hut that's about um, maybe like eight by ten, two and a half meters by uh, you know, around three meters. So you're in this hut, you're sitting on your bed. If you're lucky, you have a chair. If you're lucky, you have a mosquito net. If you're really lucky, um, it's pretty where you are. That would be really lucky. And sometimes you're just in the midst of all of these trees and bugs and insects and mosquitoes and with an uncomfortable bed and they plant you there until you get your plant, really get your songs, get your understanding of what the world is that you're exploring and experiencing. So the first time I did this, I was sitting in my hut all alone, just started and I'm thinking to myself, this is the best thing ever. I don't have to talk to people. I don't have to eat much. I don't have to, you know, think about what I need to do because there's nothing I need to do. I don't have to do anything. I can just sit and meditate all day long. So I started to meditate all day long. And in about 10 minutes, it hit me that I'd be doing this for weeks. And it was like, what the, what am I doing? You know, this is going to be, I'm bored already. And it's only been like 20 minutes, you know, maybe an hour, but I'm bored already. I'm tired of this already. I want to like talk to people and, you know, heal people and work on people and read a book because you're not allowed to read books. I want to hear some music. You're not allowed to listen to music. It's just you and yourself and kind of you know this is what i'm feeling right now is what many of us may be going through because there's a certain point of this process of dieta when all of the stuff hits the fan you know everything that is going on inside of you just becomes huge Everything going inside of you, going on inside of you becomes too much to handle. It's too much. You're faced with the shadow side. You're faced with your 
guilts and remorses, you're faced with your heartbreaks, you're faced with your insufficiencies, your self-judgments, you're faced with everything. And it's so intense, you know, and it's so intense for those of us who are really used to being doers in this world, used to accomplishing stuff, used to making things, used to knowing what it is that we need to be doing. You know, I used to, I used to like draw out a schedule for my days and I'd have my schedule planned weeks in advance. Nine o'clock, go to my office. 10 o'clock, see first patient, see this patient, this patient, this patient, take an hour break or two hour break for lunch, then see this patient, this patient, this patient. Then it was go home or go to this meeting or go to that meeting or go out on a date or sit uh, and watch a TV show or whatever it was. Everything was scheduled out. So now we've had literally all the distractions taken away from us. There's nothing to be distracted by. There's Facebook, you know, but even that, I think for a lot of people is getting pretty, for me, it's getting really boring again. And for me, it's getting to a place where I'm going to turn it off very soon. You know, so in the dieta process, the opportunity is there for self-healing. For tuning in, they say, tuning into the spirit of the plants. And to me, that means tuning into yourself. Allowing those energies of nature to come into your heart. Allowing those en energies of nature to come into your mind, to come into your thoughts. To really place an effect upon you and to, to sit and go through whatever it is that's being brought up, to sit and go through whatever it is that's coming up. And we have that opportunity now. We may be stuck in my state here, California. Uh, they just extended the confinement to middle of May, middle of May which is another month. And, uh, you know, part of me hears that and it's like, no, I can't do this. It's not possible. I just cannot handle not having friends over, not pouring somebody a cup of tea, not having deep conversations. And on the other hand, I recognize my opportunity. I recognize my opportunity to have this extraordinary time that will never be repeated again, as far as I know, hopefully, of not even voluntary dieta, but involuntary dieta. So I'm kind of recommending that people who want to go deeper on this path do this now look at it as an opportunity. I had a whole conversation with somebody this morning about how his evil governor in Kentucky is not allowing people to go to church for Easter Sunday of all things. Yeah, and good, really good. Maybe people will find that church inside of themselves. Maybe people will start to recognize that they need to take this opportunity to find that temple within. So in advice, in the land of advice, my advice for everybody in this beautiful community is to utilize this time period for a dieta. Simplify the diet. 
a bit. You know, cut out spices. Cut out meats. Cut out onions and garlic. And spend a lot of time going inside, listening, tuning in. Unless something like this happens, there will never again be a time that's as quiet as right now. Will never again happen that the world is this quiet. There's hardly any airplanes, hardly any cars, hardly anything going on. So it turns, I think one of the, one of the ways I, I work with people a lot is trying to point out the opportunity within the challenge. Trying to point out that, well, how can you utilize the situation that life is placed in front of you, sometimes right up against your nose? How can you utilize this time period for your highest benefit, for your highest good? Because it's there, you know, David Byrne, your problem is an opportunity. It's a gift in disguise. It's a chance to change. Wise words, very wise words. So as we continue in this, in this COVID-19 um, nuttiness that we're in, this tragedy really for so many, this extraordinary time, what does it mean to take advantage of it? What is the opportunity that's so powerful and so beautiful? This is what I'm seeing right now. I wanted, I wanted today to go try something a little bit different because what I often recognize when I'm doing ceremony is that most people have no idea what I'm doing. You know, making some funny sounds up there, singing some weird songs. What's going on? You know, so this is something I want to do is start to just explain parts of it or maybe a song that I sing. And I wanted, wanted to start today with the Heart Sutra because the Heart Sutra, and I'll sing it later, the Heart Sutra is a song that a lot of people find scary. You know, and I don't mind scaring people in ceremony a little bit. It's kind of fun. But they find the Heart Sutra scary because there's not an understanding of what it is. So the Heart Sutra was technically written by Buddha or taking it to a few levels more cosmic channeled by the uh, Buddhist deity Avalokiteshvara. And Avalokiteshvara is the bodhisattva of compassion. So bodhisattva is a being like you and me who has achieved liberation, has gone to the deepest depths of their soul, their mind, their body, their karmas, their past, their past lifetimes, everything and got everything sparkling clean cleaned it all out so that there's actually nothing holding them to this plane anymore. There's nothing that they're attached to. There's nothing that they want. There's nothing that 
they're sad about or upset about or in pain about. They feel no pain, emotional pain. Of course, if you hit them on the finger with a the hammer, they probably yelp. You know, but it's the emotional angst and pain that is so much a part of so many people's lives that they have conquered. So Avalokiteshvara would be more commonly in the in uh, South Asian Buddhism, Avalokiteshvara is a male deity. When Avalokiteshvara, when Buddhism entered China, Avalokiteshvara became a female deity called Kuan Yin. And most people know Kuan Yin or Guan Yin as the goddess of compassion, the goddess of mercy, the goddess of this infinite ocean. She's often depicted on an ocean or you know, in the back of a dragon, the Chinese symbol for power, for raw power. And so Avalokiteshvara is the original manifestation of, of this god of compassion, or the bodhisattva of compassion, a free being. So what the bodhisattva, what makes a bodhisattva different from somebody who uh, does all of that, is free, has no attachments, is connected 24-7, 365 to divinity within, has no needs, has no wants, has no desires. And when they die, they go into what's called in Hinduism, Maha Samadhi, the great Samadhi, the great merging with all that is the great release into beauty free from the need to ever return to a bodied form again. They just dance in the cosmos. So a bodhisattva has that opportunity. They're given that opportunity. And yet the bodhisattva chooses, chooses to return to Earth or probably any other planet in the cosmos, but we'll use Earth, chooses that opportunity to return to Earth and for no gain of their own, fulfilling no desires of their own, choose to maintain an incarnation, no matter how many incarnations it takes, until there's no suffering left anywhere in the universe. So Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion, meditating deeply on perfection of wisdom. saw clearly that the five aspects of human existence are empty and so released himself from suffering. So there's many translations of this. I do not know the original Sanskrit and I will assume that the original Sanskrit has deeper meanings to it than what I have gleaned from it. But what I have gleaned from this is that, you know, Avalokiteshvara is sitting someplace in complete focused meditation and began the process of recognition that everything in his experience is subjective, is filtered through judgment, is filtered through good and bad, is filtered through duality. And he realized this, if there's no good or no bad, what does that feel like? 
you know, just imagine that in your existence, there's no good and no bad. How many times a day do we judge? This is good. This is bad. This blanket on my bed is good. The one that I threw away was bad. This way to cook rice is good. This way to cook rice is bad. I'm not saying there's not good ways to do things. There are. But this thought is good. That thought is bad. And suddenly I'm in duality. Suddenly I'm spinning in the infinite permutations of my mind because one tiny piece of judgment of self or others, one tiny, tiny piece of judgment starts a cascade that leads to suffering and sometimes great suffering. So one tiny judgment, the fifth Zen patriarch said, locks one out of the gates of heaven forever. One judgment the size of a grain of sand locks one out of the gates of heaven forever. How many times a day do we judge ourselves? Our experience, our spiritual growth, our mental health, our place in life, our relationships, our age, the things that we could have done, should have done, might have done, and didn't do. How many times a day does that happen? Duality. It's also called enslavement. Enslavement to the categorical nonsense that the mind continuously tells us. So Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion, 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 seeing everything of this human condition with eyes of love and acceptance and understanding and wisdom and compassion. Answering the monk Sariputra, he said this, so it doesn't, doesn't say what Sariputra asked him, but this monk Sariputra, who was the beginning of a long lineage, obviously asked him something, probably about the nature of suffering and how to avoid suffering. But answering the monk Sariputra, he said this, ah, first line is body is nothing more than emptiness and emptiness is nothing more than body so one of the things that's explained in this over and over again in, in different ways is a very important tenet that in a reality as far as I can see that all of these things, all of the pain, all of the desires, all of the yearnings, everything does not really exist. We talked about this last week. You were here last week about that... Uh, no real God would ever allow suffering in the Hafez poem. So it's not real, is what this, this Heart Sutra says. 
Heart Sutra being the heart of Buddhism, not the physical heart. The body is exactly empty, taking it one step stronger. It's not just empty, it's exactly empty. It's exactly, exactly empty. Therefore, everything that seems to be not emptiness is illusory, is part of the illusion. You know, there was a idea that nothing is real, that the desk you're sitting on, the chair you're sitting on, the people in your life, none of it is real. It's an idea. But this is saying that your relationship to it is not real. What you think about it, the thoughts are not real. Exactly empty. The other four aspects of human existence, feeling, thought, will, and consciousness are likewise nothing more than emptiness. And emptiness is nothing more than they. So now it's getting more specific that it's now pointing to the inside, to these things that we think with our empty thoughts. But the things that we think make us who we are. Our thoughts, our judgments, our feelings, the so powerful human feelings, so powerful, will, the desire to create, the desire to make things happen, consciousness, our sense of who we are. Likewise, nothing more than emptiness. Emptiness is nothing more than they. Now, at this point, it starts to get freaky. What's Avalokiteshvara talking about? There's no mind, there's no will, there's no... Con of course I'm conscious, of course I think. Of course. But if you take this like one step deeper, or one step, maybe a side step, this is instruction for meditation. This is instruction for sitting and doing Zazen meditation, Buddhist meditation. Notice the thought, it's not real, let it go. You notice an impulse to do something, let it go. You notice that you want to like, think, let it go. Because all that becomes real is meditating deeply on the perfection of wisdom, on that perfection of wisdom within. All things are empty. Nothing is born nothing dies, nothing is pure, nothing is stained, nothing increases, nothing decreases. So these are the, these are the dualities that make up the world of the mind. Nothing is born. Where? here. Nothing dies. Where? Here. If I'm sitting and I'm thinking about being born and dying, karma, all of these things, I'm losing it. I'm missing it. Nothing is pure. Nothing is stained. That kind of obliterates the guilt of the Judeo-Christian religions. Nothing increases, nothing decreases. 
sitting there in that state, letting it all go, letting all these things go. And so in emptiness, there is no body, no feeling, no thoughts, no will, no consciousness. Emptiness is the state in Buddhist meditation that you try to get to. Thoughts come up, you let them go. Feelings come up, you let them go. Will comes up, you let it go. Consciousness comes up, you let it fall away from you. Until you're just sitting there. There are no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. Creepy. Because you're sitting there with eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. You go deeper. You go deeper until you go so deep that there are no eyes, no ears, no tongue, no nose, no body, no mind. And what they do. There is no seeing, no hearing, no touching, no tasting, no touching, no imagining, no smelling, no tasting, no touching, no imagining. That takes focus. That takes time. Because when you sit, when I sit, within seconds, I mean, somebody, somebody said, what would you rather be in visit? What superpower would you rather be invisible or be able to hear everybody's thoughts? And it's like, hear everybody's thoughts, damn, I can barely handle my own. I can barely handle my own. Nothing seen, nor heard, nor smelled, nor tasted, nor touched, nor imagined. So when you go that deep into that state of no being, of nothingness, you know, that's the beginning of the path. That's the beginning of it. It's not the end point, it's the beginning. There is no ignorance and no end to ignorance. Ignorance is another concept we have. There is no old age and death, no end to old age and death, more concepts. There is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no end to suffering. Getting creepy again, you know. So when you're sitting in that state, There is, actually is no suffering. Nothing can cause you suffering because where does suffering exist? No real God would allow suffering. Yet we suffer. No real God would allow pain, yet we have pain. In the Heart Sutra, it's saying, you know, Basically, my interpretation, sit your ass down and don't move until these thoughts and judgments are gone. Also known as in Peruvian jungle language as dieta. The dieta process. There is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no end to suffering. There is no path to follow. There is no path to follow. In Peruvian Amazon, in Amazonian shamanism, they talk about the camino, the way, the path. In Taoism, they talk about the way, or the path. So there's no path to follow. What 
does not mean when one has sat without moving for long enough, all of those thoughts fall away into nothingness. All of those thoughts vanish into the non-existence from which they came. No suffering, no cause of suffering, no end to suffering. Just all gone. All gone. Not in the world, not outside. But in you, where it really matters. There is no attainment of wisdom and no wisdom to attain. How much of what we call spirituality is based on obtaining wisdom? You know, I read this book. I read that book. I didn't read this book. I didn't read that book. I went to this seminar, I went to that seminar. I'm a wise person because I have 20 certificates on my walls and a diploma from a good university. I've really attained wisdom. I really understand. This is saying, screw it. It's not real either. In emptiness. In that position of just sitting. You become the king. You become closer to Buddhahood each time it's done. No wisdom to attain. The bodhisattvas, again, the ones that have chosen to come back lifetime after lifetime to assist all living beings to be without suffering, to provide a beacon of what true liberation looks like, of what it truly looks like to be human. Because they've chosen to endure the physical suffering of human life to help others out of their suffering, or maybe just to be a beacon that others can see to help them out of suffering. In a very high state. I would, I would say personally that the Bodhisattva state is a much higher state than the one that just chooses to merge back into the cosmos. The perfection of wisdom is the greatest to mantra. Mantra means, or the mantra is something that uh, controls the mind. Controls the mind, focuses the mind. Often it's spoken of as words, like the famous Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna is a mantra. And in Hinduism, every single god has their mantra that people will chant endlessly trying to get that god to do them a boon or a favor. Along with fire rituals and butter sacrifices, ghee sacrifices, and in the past animal and even human sacrifices to try to curry the favor of one of these gods. This is saying that's emptiness. The bodhisattvas rely on the perfection of wisdom. Where is the perfection of wisdom? It's within. And so with no delusions, 
delusions is such an interesting word I mean, to uh, you know illusions and delusions what's the difference My dictionary is not working. Um, wait a second. There it is. An idiosyncratic belief or impression maintained despite being contradicted by reality, irrational argument, typically as a symptom of mental disorder. So, that's pretty intense in that it's saying that all of our fears, all of our judgments, all of our analysis and seeking wisdom and trying to figure things out and being spiritual and, you know, going for the right things in our life, in our internal world. is almost a mental illness. And so with no delusions, they feel no fear and have nirvana here and now. Nirvana is the state of, it's not a, it's actually a band, but it's initially the state of this freedom, this absolute freedom from pain and suffering. And again, internally, here, here, here. All of the Buddhas, all of the, and so with no delusions, they feel no fear and have nirvana here and now. They feel no fear. What an amazing state to feel no fear. This to me is one of the biggest lessons of ayahuasca work and plant medicine work is because it confronts us with our fears, our fear of letting go, our fear of transcending, our fear of just being sitting on the pillow with that powerful medicine coursing through our body, mind and spirit. How would it be to, to really be in that medicine place with absolutely no fear? Or to be in life with no fear? Life and death are simply a passing fad, said Hafez. Passing fad. All of the Buddhas, Buddha means awakened one. Historically, when we use the word Buddha, we think about the Satmuna, Satmuna Buddha or Gautama Buddha who walked in India and started basically the idea of Buddhism. <clears throat> but there's many Buddhas, many awakened ones, past, present, and future. We lie in the perfection of wisdom and live in full enlightenment or awakening. I love, I love the idea of Buddha in particular because of the idea of the awakened one. And if Buddha is awakened, what does that make all of us? Basically still in the dream. But this gives hope because we can wake up from the dream. We can wake up from the suffering, from the causes of suffering, from our desires for suffering to end. We can wake from all of that and feel no fear and feel perfect awakening, live in full enlightenment. If this wasn't something that every human being could do, 
that wanted to do it, the world would be a cruel joke where you know, he with the most toys or she with the most toys when they die wins the game. As if when you die, you give a shit about what kind of toys you have. This is saying, now awaken. Wake up from this dream. Wake up. The perfection of wisdom is the greatest mantra, the greatest way to control the mind. And I'll talk about mantras at some point too, because I think my intuitive hit on this is that they're not talking about a mantra in the traditional sense of a mantra, which is repeating the same words over and over and over again. It is the clearest mantra, the highest mantra, that mantra that removes all suffering. This is truth that cannot be doubted. Say it so. So this suddenly gets very big, gets very infinite, that there's actually this perfection of wisdom, this focusing the mind to let it, allow it to let go of everything and continuing to just sit, even after you think you've let go of everything, even after you think you're clear, even after you feel like you've obtained something, there is no attainment. Keep sitting. Gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisva. And this means um, gone, gone, gone fully over, gone fully over, hail to the one who goes there. So the reason why I think that the gate gate, I love singing it. It's really fun to sing. You've all heard me sing it a lot if you've been to ceremonies. Um, it's really fun to sing. It's really beautiful. It's acknowledging the one who goes beyond the beyond. Samaha means hail. You know, whew, you've done it. You've gone beyond the beyond. My thing would be now go beyond the beyond the beyond and beyond that and beyond that and beyond that. And so the reason I don't think it's words is because if there's no mouth and no tongue, how do you say a mantra? If there's no mind, how do you repeat the mantra in your mind? If there's no eyes, how do you see the yantra, the depiction of the mantra that's so beautiful and artistic on the wall? If you ever want an interesting afternoon, find a yantra and take some mushrooms and stare at it. Quite interesting what happens. This is not advice call it an example, gone fully over. So you've transcended. In, in ceremony, which is really what I'm trying to uh, give lessons in, in these Sunday councils, in ceremony, it means that moment when you fully let go and trust the experience you're having and let Madre Ayahuasca show you everything that she wants to show you. Not that what you need to see, what you, not what you want to see, but that's being revealed, unveiled to you in light, in joy, in love, the unveiling, the releasing. Gate, gate, para gate, para sangate, bodhisattva. I first heard this a long, long, long time ago, and the uh, Allen Ginsberg was singing it on a beach near San Francisco, and I was walking along this beach, and I didn't know who Allen Ginsberg was, and there was this guy playing a harmonium and singing, and uh, I think I was, 
for definitely on something. I think it was acid. I think I took acid and mescaline that day. I was crazy when I was young. And, you know, this like beautiful energy and whoa, the sounds. And I just walked over and he's like, Gate, Gate, Para, Gate, Para, Sam, Gate, Bodhisvaha, over and over and over again. And really a beautiful experience. But the words aren't it. The words are the direction, are the guidance. Go beyond. Go beyond that. Go beyond that. Go beyond that. And go beyond that. And then go beyond that. And then go beyond that. If you think you've accomplished everything there is to accomplish in this world of internal growth, you haven't. Simply haven't. If a being says they're enlightened, to be careful. They stopped. Yeah. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. That's the Heart Sutra. Just keep going. Hail. Cheers. Accolades. Respect to the one who goes there. And then in the last one that I sing, I say, be the one who goes there. That's what it's saying anyway. But just to clarify, this is not, you know, hail to the one who goes there is not hero worship. It's so common in human religion. It's like we place people on pedestals and say, this person is now an enlightened being. This person has arrived. This is saying, uh, uh, be the one. Hail to the one who goes there. Hail to the, at least Buddhas in training that we all are. Hail to the Bodhisattvas in training that we all are. When we go beyond. Uh. Is that good? Valuable? Thank you. Kabir. Kabir, who's my favorite poet of any poet, did a poem that's the kind of rebuttal to that. Let me see if I can find it. And Somebody once told me, you know, if you want to get five opinions on something, ask two Jews. And uh, being of that pers persuasion, being of that growth in my childhood, I always like things that uh, oh, I see what I'm doing. I always like things that contradict each other and make me think more. And so Kabir is like the great, Kabir was like the great um, I would call Kabir a spiritual fuck you artist, you know, because he took everybody and put them down. Like of the of the sadhus who walk around India wearing their orange robes and don't bathe. He said, you guys smell like goats. What are you doing with your lives? You, know, you guys think you're great, but you're not. So the rebuttal from Kabir, or maybe an add-on, probably more of an add-on than a rebuttal, is one of my favorite Kabir poems. It says, to what shore would you cross all oh, my heart right away when he says all oh, my heart you know you're not in buddhism anymore because in buddhism all oh, my heart your heart doesn't exist there's no body kabir is a lover i like kabir better but kabir is a lover 
loves God, loves the heart. So he says, to what shore would you cross, O my heart? There is no traveler before you. There is no road. There is no path to follow. There is no traveler before you. There are no eyes, no ears, no nose. Where is the movement? Where is the rest on that shore? The idea that you have to go someplace is depicted as crossing the river. Is depicted as crossing the river. But there's no water. There's no boat. No boatman is there. There's not so much as a rope to tow the boat, nor a man to draw it. In the Buddhist idea of nothing exists, there's nothing, there's nothing inside, there's nothing. And he's saying, you know, what are you going to do when you get there? There's no earth, no sky, no time, no thing is there, no shore, no ford. There's neither body nor mind. And this is the interesting part because Kabir says, and where is the place that shall still the thirst of the soul? Where is that place that shall still the thirst of the soul. So Kabir went deeper and recognized that, you know, you can go into the state of emptiness and nothingness. Remember I said, it's the first step. A Buddhist would disagree with me. Mind you, don't quote me to a Buddhist, please. But to me, it's like, that's the first step. Kabir is saying, you know, you'll find nothing in that emptiness. You'll find not in that emptiness. Where is the place that will still the thirst, the yearning, the desire of the soul, which he is saying is a really good thing. And he says, be strong, be strong and enter into your own body. That means, again, leaving the thoughts, leaving the concepts, leaving the traditions. Enter into your own body, for there your foothold is firm. And remember who he's talking to. To what shore would you cross, O oh my heart? Be strong and enter into your own body, for there your foothold is firm. Consider it, oh, what, consider it well, O oh my heart, and go not elsewhere. Consider it well, O oh my heart, go not elsewhere. Be in your body. Allow your heart to be exactly where your heart is. Allow your heart to be exactly where your heart is. Don't go elsewhere. Don't wander off into thoughts and concepts and ideas. Stay. Sit and stay, right? Kabir says, put all imaginations away and stand fast in that which you are. So, you know, putting all imaginations away is that discrimination of recognizing what's you, what's not you, what's taught, what's real, what's actually there versus what we want to be there. how to be so simple like a child to see with the eyes of a child that inner universe how to be that simple how to be that clear that clean 
becomes the answer is what sitting practice does, is what medicine work helps you to go towards and what the purpose of human existence is. Consider it well, O my heart. Go not elsewhere. So to be in that place of love. Mahayana Buddhists would say, there is no love. That's part of the illusion. Whereas Kabir would say, love is all that exists throughout the entire cosmos. There is nothing that exists other than love. Rumi says, love says, there is nothing that is not me. There is nothing that is not me. I prefer that universe. Although I like the Heart Sutra a lot, but I prefer the Kabir universe of love, the Rumi universe of love, the Jesus universe of love. That's what I love, is love itself. That to me fulfills life and makes everything worthwhile.